Hi, I'm Lauren Decker, Youth Librarian at the Kershaw County Library. Welcome to our St. Patrick's Day program. Have you worn green today? I can't. You see all this back here? If I did, I'd be a talking head, which would actually be kind of funny looking. I have a book I want to show you, a quick craft, and some Irish music for our program today. What does St. Patrick's Day mean to you? Valentine's Day is love and hearts. St. Patrick's Day, magic. Leprechaun magic, looking for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, following that rainbow, knowing and hoping that there's magic there in the world. Maybe we have to make our own magic. The book that I want to show you here today is One Jar of Magic by Corey Ann Haydew, published by Catherine Teagan Books, an imprint of HarperCollins Books. This is a new book in our collection. The story is about Rose Alice Anders, who is Little Luck. She's the youngest member of the Anders family, and dad in the Anders family is special. He is magical, and the town reveres him. He is he's powerful. So, the story, though, is about Rose, who is waiting to turn 12. It seems like the whole town is waiting for her to turn 12 because at that point in her life, on New Year's Day, everybody in town gets to grab for their jars of magic. The only problem with for Rose, though, was that she only grabbed, was able to grab one jar of magic, and that's like unheard of. She's the only one that ever grabbed so few jars. Uh-oh, what does all that mean? What does that mean? Dad won't talk to her anymore. Her friendships are all twisted and wrong. It's just not right anymore. What does that mean for Rose? Maybe, maybe she's not supposed to be magical. Gonna find out. And I thought that I would read a chapter. Maybe not, maybe not the whole chapter, but this is just chapter 28. This isn't a conversation, Mom says. This is definitely a conversation, I say. This is Rose talking. We're talking right now, back and forth. She means it isn't a negotiation, Lyle says. He's at the kitchen counter helping mom make pasta salad by chopping on celery and whisking vinegar with oil. And I should be helping too, except I can't seem to put down Ginger's birthday party invitation. I'm bringing Zelda, I say. Every year, Ginger's family throws a birthday party for her or not just for her, for all of them, Ginger and all of her siblings and also her mom. And when her dad was here for him too. They all have birthdays in the winter months and instead of trying to throw nine different birthday parties, they throw one big one. They save up their magic for it. They choose which jars seem the most likely to be able to make perfect weather and a delicious meal, and every year there's something unexpected and thrilling, a bit of magic no one knew about. Last year it was a lemonade fountain. The, the year before that, there were pony rides on pink and purple ponies. And before that, there was the biggest bouncy house I've ever seen. Bigger than any house in town. It played musical notes on every bounce, making the whole thing extra loud and extra fun and extra magical. Ginger and I used to like to make lists of things that might happen, 
trying to imagine which jars might have the strangest magic, which jars might hold something we'd never seen or heard of before. Ginger and I had so many traditions, it's hard to escape them. They pop up like weeds everywhere I look. Even what we're cooking right now is a tradition. On top of whatever the magic makes, the rest of us bring food to the party. We always bring non-magical pasta salad. Mom says it tastes better without magic. Dad never helps us make it. I'm not sure he ever eats it. I told you to forget about that girl, Mom says. And now you want to bring her to your best friend's birthday party? What's gotten into you? She's not my best friend anymore. Well, bringing Zelda wouldn't help that at all. She has a new best friend that isn't me. So I need a best friend too. And no one wants to be best friends with one jar girl, especially not Ginger. She even has a boyfriend to go along with her new life. I hadn't meant to tell mom about Evan Bell. And even thinking about him makes my insides all cloudy and pinchy. Ginger has a boyfriend, Lyle says. He starts to laugh. It's not funny, I say. It's a little funny, Lyle says. It's not about whether or not Ginger needs you, Mom says, although I'm sure she does. It's about living our lives. It's about you still being you no matter what happened. We can't go changing everything around just because you had a hard start to the year. Mom hands me the bowl of ingredients to stir, and I do. Lyle keeps shaking his head and laughing about Ginger and her boyfriend. Outside, the sky is turning bluer and bluer and bluer. It has been a gray day. It had been a gray day when we woke up, but not anymore. The magic has begun. Life without magic is, well, it's nice, but it's not for us, and it's too confusing to invite Zelda. When Mom says the word nice, she looks like she really means it. She actually looks like she means more than nice, like she means special or beautiful or better. But she doesn't want to talk about it. It shouldn't surprise me that Mom wants to pretend nothing is happening, that everything's fine. That's one blue sky, Dad says. He's coming in from outside where he's been practicing his capturing moves, I guess. His feet are bare, and he's got a line of sweat over his lip and on his forehead. Warm, too, he says. They got some strong magic this year, that's for sure. I wonder if he sees how the words puncture me. It's impossible not to talk about magic when it's still January and, we're li and we live in Belling Bright and the sky is turning blue and the air is turning warm and delicious the way only magic can make it feel. But still, I wish we could talk about anything else. Beautiful day, Mom says. All the words are normal. But I'm not normal, which makes the words sound weird. Fake beautiful, I say. I don't know what makes me say it exactly, especially in front of Dad. But once the words are out, they can't exactly go anywhere else. So we're all stuck with them. We shift around. Mom swallows so loudly, I can hear it. Lyle stares at his feet. Dad just stares at me. Where'd you hear that? He says at last. Hear what? Fake beautiful. Who said that to you? No one, I say. I just m meant that, like, the sky isn't really blue. It's magically blue. So it's not, it's not like a surprise or really special, it's just magic. 
I hadn't thought out the words ahead of time, but when I say them, they feel true. Truer than that blue sky, at least, and that's something. Magic isn't special now, Dad says. I just mean it would be even cooler if the sky just did this on its own. Why? Dad asks. Mom and Lyle stir and chop and clear their throats. What would make that better? Would it be prettier? Blue is blue, Rose. It would be real, I say. Not fake, Dad says. Yes, not fake beautiful. He reacts again to those particular words in that particular order. He looks at Mom. I'll stop there. Sound interesting? It's a good story. So let's do the craft now. We're gonna make this origami shamrock bookmark. It's not hard. What you see here are the supplies that you'll need. The scissors, pencil, a marker, um, and a square sheet of paper. If you were able to pick up this take and make at the library doors, everything you need is right here, except for the scissors and the marker and pencil. Here are instructions. Here's a little cootie catcher. You just fold along the lines. We'll work on that one too. But this origami bookmark, I thought we could do together. If you weren't able to pick up the take and makes at the library doors, all you need is a piece of square paper. Any color. Um, this paper is six inches by six inches. So, to begin, um, put your colored side down if you have a colored side. And I want you to take that square, hold it up like a diamond, and fold the bottom point up to the top point. Crease. See the triangle you have? Take your right point and fold it up to the top point. Increase. And do the same on the other side. Your left point goes up to the top point. Increase this one too. Now again, you have a square, kind of laid out in the shape of a diamond. Open up your points, bring your points back down, and you're back to your, your original triangle. All right, now, keeping the straight edge on the bottom, I want you to separate the top point. I want you to bend down and fold the top point to the straight edge and crease it here. Then, you don't have to do this, but I like doing it. I'm gonna turn that fold so I can see the colors of my paper inside. Now I've got my, still my one point of white showing, and that's fine. Go back to your right point, fold it back up to the top, but I want you to take that point and now stuff it down into this pocket you've made just by turning it in and crease it. And you'll do the same thing on the other side. Fold it back up, but turn it down into the pocket. And crease. And that is essentially your bookmarker. Because if you were to take a book on the top page, 
you just slide and cover the page and it becomes a bookmarker. Now though, we're gonna turn this bookmarker into a shamrock. So turn it all over. No, actually don't turn it over yet. Do this first. You want to create these hearts making a leaf of your shamrock. So you're going to put a little, take your pencil, a little circle on each side of your center line and it's going to be cut in the shape of a heart. And just freehand this and make another one this way, which you're going to create your leaf going into the white side. You can round your edges as you cut. And the same thing happens over here. So you see your clover shape and you want to put a stem down here. And you're going to cut that out. Just as you drew it. There it is, my completed shamrock bookmark. And it looks even more cute than that plain old triangle thing. Listen to this Irish fiddle tune Gracie and I are going to play for you. It's called the Swallowtail Jig. Thanks for watching. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you.